Welcome back. It is another episode of the Find Me in Seattle podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. It is Friday, July 24th, and I hope you guys are doing well today. The week are going by so quickly now, where in 2019, it was always the weekends were going by so slow and, or so quickly and the weeks go by so slow. I feel like it's reverse. I'm enjoying my weekends so much more. They seem to last a little bit longer, pretty much because I'm not doing anything. And so it's nice. I feel like at nine in the morning, I look at the clock and I'm like, great, I got so much time left today. And at noon, I'm like, oh, great, I got so much time today. And it's just nice. I feel like I'm appreciating the length of the day a little bit more. Uh, but all right, let's get into the show before I ramble on anymore. So what I'm gonna start to do here with the show is I've been trying to figure out how am I going to balance the understanding of what's going on in our city and the news and the news cycle without diving too much into politics because that can go down uh, a real deep rabbit hole and there's a lot of different places that you can go to get opinions about politics and understand ideas and listen to candidates and everything. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start every episode with a here's the headlines of the week and main things that you might want to look up if you're curious about what's going on in Seattle. So this is my new segment. It's called This Week in Seattle News. The biggest thing that everyone's talking about happened on Thursday this week. The Seattle NHL team officially announced their name. That We are going to be going by the Seattle Kraken. Release the Kraken was the big slogan. They did the unveil of the logos and the jersey and branding and some of the ideas with this big virtual event yesterday. And it seemed like it was a smash hit. I am very surprised. There was so much dialogue going on about who the name was going to be, right? And people people seem to be legitimately angry about the different names that they were going to choose. And obviously right now in the 2020 world, names are very, very important and how we use them and who they're based off of is very important. And the Kraken seemed like it got pretty good reviews. It didn't seem like all the people who wanted Sockeyes or Steelhead or maybe even Totems weren't actually all that mad when everything came out. The big highlight of the branding was this icon, which I think the Sounders and the Mariners, two other Seattle teams, are very jealous that they didn't come up with. It's this uh, ship anchor, and at the top of the anchor is the Space Needle. And it was just very clever. It's very simple, uh, but also very unique and specific to us. I love that they kept this like ocean theme going. So we have the Sounders and the Mariners, uh, which are all related obviously to uh, the Puget Sound. And then we have the Kraken. So I think we kind of have this above and below water concept going. And I think that's pretty cool. Uh, was a little surprised it wasn't a nest name. I feel like we have a lot of uh, Seattle Sounders, Seattle Seahawks, Seattle Storm, uh, but that's not that big of a deal. And I'm excited. Season's going to kick off in 2021. Uh, we don't know when we can get jerseys, but they also have, I don't know what the promotion is, I didn't write it down, but if you buy like a t-shirt or a hat right now, I know they're donating some to some local charities. Uh, so let's go Kraken, let's get Kraken on the rest of this news here. Uh, so also yesterday, Jay Inslee, governor of Washington, he's rolling back some of the COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, we're kind of going to a mixed phase, but starting next Thursday, uh, so in time for the next podcast, inside Dining in at restaurants is gonna be limited to parties of no more than five people, and they pretty much have to be in the same household. I don't know how they're gonna necessarily check that, uh, but that is new. And they're gonna stop selling alcohol after 10 p.m. at all bars and restaurants. And so I assume that's just a worry of getting people to not stay at bars, right? And not stay out. The more intoxicated you get, I assume social distancing becomes a little bit harder to do, and so, no alcohol after 10 p.m. Um, bars. Bars are pretty much going to be closed for indoor service. Bars are only going to be able to serve alcohol if they have an outdoor seating area or establishment. I'm very curious on how this is going to change with uh, what bars are uh, trying to create and do. A lot of those breweries and small bars that have outdoor seating are at a big advantage right now to stay open. And uh, the one place I, I did a feature on Pyramid brewing a couple weeks ago and they recently shut down their giant space by the baseball stadium 
And that just seems like the perfect opportunity. It stinks that they're not there anymore, but it's a giant recreational area. It seemed like it'd be a great place to have outdoor seating and kind of a pseudo temporary beer garden. Uh, other thing, indoor recreation, like gyms are gonna be limited to five people. I'm not sure where they are at. My gym is not open and they're, they've been doing everything online. So gyms seem to be relatively the same. But yeah, a lot of stuff getting rolled back. We gotta uh, re-flatten the curve, as they would say. And we'll figure that out. COVID-19, not going away anytime soon. Another big announcement, the King County Executive, his name is Dow Constantine, committed to converting all the youth detention units um, to have new uses by the end of 2025. They, you know, that's a commitment. That's not actual action. So we're going to stay on top of that and see what happens. But I know uh, that has been a part of the BLM defund the police initiative and this has been going on for far longer than some of these uh defund the police conversations have been going but i know a lot of people are really excited about that and and the changes to come there and, and hopefully keep them accountable if you're interested in learning more about that uh give it a little google the no new no new youth jail coalition are the ones who have been heading that up for uh, for a while now we had uh, some more protests this week and gonna be going on in through the weekend. Uh, one of the big protests this week was uh, against ICE and there was a lot of broken glass throughout the city. Not a lot of broken glass. They pretty much attacked Starbucks, Amazon, and the few local businesses they attacked have been ones that uh, have ruffled some of the feathers of some of these protesters, uh, one specifically being Uncle Ike's. Um, and so it's, I heard stories that they were very adamant at the protest to like not break the windows of the regular local businesses. It was very, um, structured on whose glass was getting broken. Um, but obviously that I wasn't there, so I don't fully know. Uh, another cool thing that I'll give, a. A question out to you guys is the Seattle Public Library, MOHAI, the Washington Historical Society, and the Log House Museum are requesting donations of COVID-19 artifacts of what society is like here in 2020. So it got me thinking about like what are my artifacts that I have here in, that I've collected in the last four months that are COVID-19 related. So the first thing I thought about was uh, the wedding ring here. You on YouTube can see that. I got this in Bangkok. I uh, pretty much bought it or the week of my wedding. It uh, was made in Bangkok. It's all custom, one of a kind, which is really cool. And so this ring is going to be something special to me because it was a mix of this covid 19 pandemic mixed with my wedding. I think that's just something that'll always remind me. And then uh, the one other thing is that stimulus check that uh, our our president sent to, and, and Congress and Senate all sent out to everyone who you know made less than I think it was 100 and. $30,000 a year. And so I actually have the check uh, up on my board. It was something that I did mobile deposit and that check I'm going to keep forever. You don't very often just get a random check sent to you from the United States government. So unfortunately it has Donald Trump's name signed on it because he delayed the checks so he could get a signature on these things. But that's really going to be my uh, big artifact. I think that I hold on to forever. I mean, I think that's going to be a check that uh, my kids will see one day and I'll say, they'll ask, well, you know, what's this $1,200 check? that you have here and i'll be like oh well when we had this lockdown they shut down the country we never seen anything like this hopefully we don't see anything like this again and uh this check is what they thought was going to make it all better it obviously was not nearly enough money to support really anyone here in seattle that one check uh did pay my rent for one month which was nice but it's it's a very small small gesture but it was it was great. I'm, I appreciate that we got the money. Uh, but that check is my artifact. I'm curious what your artifact is going to be. If you have any ideas, you can hit me up in the DMs on Instagram or, or shoot me a tweet about your, your COVID-19 artifact. Um, and I'll, I'll tweet that out here. You can respond there. What else? That's, that's it, actually. Thank you for joining the, this week in Seattle news. Da -da 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 -da. I got to add some music and stuff to this, don't I? Uh, all right. Now we're going to the next section of the podcast i'm going to be talking about what's the best thing that i ate this week this is i know going to be a weekly feature here on the show is pretty much what i was doing before i stopped the show and the best thing i've eaten i get this question a lot on my instagram where is the best breakfast burrito and i am an 
avid fan of breakfast burritos. I feel like burritos are one of those foods that I can eat all the time because there's so much you can do with it. You can be creative. There's so many different things you can put in there. It's really just uh, a tortilla and whatever else you want in there. And so breakfast burritos. I do have a few recommendations for breakfast burritos, but I think right now the best breakfast burrito in Seattle is from Stoneway Cafe in Wallingford. Obviously it's on Stoneway. Um, and I think they have something that's called crack sauce, but you can put a bunch of meat in it. It's fully loaded. It is giant. It is greasy. It's full of potatoes and eggs, and it's just absolutely delicious and a giant mess. And you, it, you feel like exploding after you're done eating it, but hands down is the best breakfast burrito that I've tried in Seattle so far. Shout out to you, Stoneway Cafe. And um, you guys can place your orders online and go and pick it up there. It's a little tiny bit of space, so make sure you wear your mask. Social distancing is a little difficult there. They do have kind of an open air space. So there is, you know, a, a good amount of seating if you want to eat there. But what we did is we walked over to Gasworks Park. We ate the burritos at the park. That was a much better experience if you ask me. Um, but shout out to you, Stoneway Cafe, my favorite breakfast burrito in Seattle. What else did I do this week that was really exciting? I drove, Amanda and I drove over to Mary Moore Park in Redmond and we attended their drive-in movie theater at the park, which was just fantastic. I know this is sold out. They're doing, um, I think there's like six or seven different movies that they're doing over the summer and they did it really well. The tickets were $25 per car. You drive up, it's first come first serve, but the way when they check you in, they measure the height of your car and they ask, are you pulling front ways? Are you pulling back ways for you know, the truck so you can sit in the truck? And they stagger all the cars by height so that you can everyone can have a view. So I thought it was really cleverly done when they're pulling everyone in, uh, everyone's facing sideways, so you're always facing the screen, and they try to stagger them so you have a pretty good view. Uh, the only downside was some people uh, you know, aren't very good about turning off their lights and uh, specifically their backlights, some cars backlights, or they have to like turn their keys every, you know, 20 minutes when their car goes off. That was, you know, a very, very minor disturbance, but it's pretty cool. They feed the audio through a radio station um, and the movie didn't start until 9 p.m. because it doesn't get dark until that time. Uh, but by the time it did get dark, it was really cool. It was a beautiful day with the, the skylight open on our car and you could see all of the stars. And the movie we were watching, was Hidden Figures, which I had not seen. And it was actually a movie I've been wanting to see for a long time, uh, not only because I uh, just love space in general, and I, th I think space as the fr a frontier is such a, a mystery to me, uh, but an incredible story uh, about three African-American women who um, made their way up the ranks at NASA. And I, I was doing a little bit of research about like what was true, what was not true. I'm not necessarily going to go in there. Uh, but to give you a, a, a little bit of a synopsis about what it is, it's uh, loosely based on the 2016 nonfiction book of the same name, Hidden Figures, by uh, Margot Lee Shetterly. And it's about black female mathematicians who worked at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, during the space race. And so it stars uh, T Taraji P. Henson as Katherine Johnson, who's kind of the, the protagonist of the story. And she's a mathematician who calculated flight trajectories for Project Mercury. This was sending uh, American up into space. And then it also features Octavia Spencer as a NASA supervisor and mathematician and Dorothy Vaughn and, or, I'm sorry, Octavia, this character is Dorothy Vaughn and Janelle Monet plays Mary Jackson, who's another NASA engineer who also made her way up the hierarchy um, there and you know, made a huge, they all made big impacts on um, the space race right here. And uh, pretty cool to see that um, Ms. Johnson now has a building named after her at NASA. I think that happened in 2016. In 2015, she was also awarded the Medal of Freedom, which is I think the highest honor that you can get in America, which is pretty cool. And uh, the story, you know, they, they fluctuate a little bit about, you know, they really try to hype up the segregation and the racism to tell that story. Um, but one of the stories that really stuck out to me that it just motivated me in thinking about the world and how the world is changing in relation to, to what we're doing here. The character played by Octavia Spencer, uh, her name is Dorothy Vaughn. Uh, she is 
on this team, she's a supervisor on this team of all African American women who are mathematicians and, and they're solving problems for NASA, right? And at the same time, IBM is developing this computer and they are starting to see and hear rumors that this computer is going to pretty much put them all out of a job, right? And so what Octavia Spencer's character starts doing is she goes to the library and starts getting a Fortran coding book and saying, I see this computer coming. I am going to invest time and I'm going to learn about this computer. So when it comes, I'm going to have a job and I'm going to focus on that. And, and there's lots of different topics, especially around race relations that you can get from this movie. Um, and it's just amazing how, um, these women's really defied the, the odds in a society that was, uh, designed to be against them for them to uh, be so accomplished and make such a big impact is amazing but but the story that i want to share here is that she saw this technology coming and she goes this is going to put me out of a job so i'm going to invest the time and i'm going to learn all about this technology so when it gets here i can provide value and be on the team and be part of this and facilitate my career moving forward and that is something that I think all of us should be thinking about. And it's so important now more than ever. I'm 31. I've got at least 30 more years of work. And how important it is to not uh, get stagnant in your education, in your growth, and the things that you're learning about. Because a lot of these companies that we all work for, they're designed for efficiency. right? We forget. We're, we're trying to make companies more human. But... The underlying goal of a company is to become as efficient as possible to maximize profit. So they're always developing these technologies and a lot of times the people developing them are putting themselves out of a job when technology gets here. And I mean, we're seeing that with disruption all over the world. And so to have the foresight to see that coming and say, I'm going to invest in learning about this thing so I can have a job, I just think is something we all can learn from. We should all be constantly thinking about because the world constantly changes. It's so important for us to also be evolving, learning new things and keeping up with the changing times because more than likely a majority of us in 20 years are still gonna be working, but the things we're working on aren't gonna be as uh, necessary, let's say essential or in demand and technology is gonna take over. So uh, be on the lookout for those things within your career, but instead of being afraid of them, uh, adopt them, embrace them, and find out where you fit within that process because uh, humans are still necessary in a lot of these jobs. And uh, I just thought that was something unique that uh, if you if you watch the movie Hidden Figures or you read articles about it, you can hear about all the other topics, but that was just something different that stuck out to me in the movie. So Hidden Figures, uh, another reason why I was so in tune with it is, is in the quarantine, I've been obsessed with figures in history and important people in specifically in American history and what they've done from all colors, creeds, origins, uh, backgrounds. And, and you know, it's so we're talking about statues in society and who's getting elevated and who's not being elevated and whose story is shared. And another reason why I've been so obsessed with the concept of who shares a story is because the musical Hamilton, which came out on July 3rd in, on Disney Plus, just like everyone else, I highly, highly recommend it. I have watched it um, maybe a dozen times, uh, watching it on TV and listening to the soundtrack um, on Spotify because Alexander Hamilton is just this person that I learned about in school. I remember learning about the Federalist Papers, but it never like really stuck about how important as a founding father he was. And as we're talking about in society, the people who we should be putting up on a pedestal and, and making a statue of and who we shouldn't, uh, he's becoming a front runner uh, for one of those people. And that's because Lynn manuel Miranda created this unbelievable musical about his life. And Amanda and I have been so obsessed with the musical because when we saw it when it was here in Seattle and I hadn't listened to it all before. And I remember being at halftime, turning to Amanda and being like, all right, this is pretty good. I'm entertained. It's very catchy, but I, I was still skeptical about the hype. I'm like, where is it where people like minds are blown? And then the second half opens and they have this, uh, um, congressional debate with Alexander Hamilton and some of the other characters. And it's a rap battle on how they discuss, uh, state versus, uh, federal rights. 
And that just blew my socks off. And that's really when I became committed. And now when I've been listening and watching it more and watching the performance with the lyrics, every single word is so cleverly written, so well thought out. Um, I learn something new about the story every time I watch it. And yeah, I've absolutely been obsessed with uh, the Hamilton musical in general and Alexander Hamilton and his story. And so um, just like for your own understanding, here are some of the things that Alexander Hamilton gets credit for and probably not enough for his influence on where we are in America. So uh, first he was... He led a company during the Revolutionary War. Uh, he had a key role in the Battle of Yorktown, which is like the last uh, ground battle of the Revolutionary War against the British. Um, that that battle kind of led to the end of the war, uh, and we fought. He fought there. Uh, he led, I think, three battalions alongside um, a group of. Uh, French battalions who also joined us in helping us um, declare our independence. He uh, was the first Secretary of the Treasury under George Washington. When he was when he was there, uh, he created uh, what the Un United States financial system is all based on now. Uh, he created the national debt when he created the first national bank. So he consolidated all of the state's debts from the Revolutionary War. And he put them all together. And now, as you can tell, we've got trillions of dollars in, in national debt. But by doing that, he really made America a finance, or he, he created the start of America becoming this financial superpower, right? And 200 plus years later, the influence that that would have on the world, um, it just is so, so big and so impactful. And how he had the mind to think of a different world is just absolutely bananas to me. Uh, he created the U.S. Mint. He created the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, so we'd have a fleet of ships that would protect our shores. Uh, he wrote the Federalist Papers, which were are now known as the most important works of political science in U.S. history. Um, and that was pretty much defending the Constitution and, and how important that was. He created the first political party, and that was known as the Federalist Party, uh, that came after he write, wrote the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Party, uh, funny enough, he actually destroyed the party because he wrote against, I believe, John Adams. Um, or was it Burr? I can't remember. Um, but he wrote kind of a opposing view and that really like destroyed the whole party. And so then the other remaining party that at that time was led by Thomas Jefferson uh, eventually leads into the Republicans and the Democrats. I think at that time it was the Republican Democrat party, uh, which was very interesting. And so he just had so much influence on the, the two party political system. And uh, he just influenced the world through his words and this unique way of writing. And I've been so caught up in like, was he America's first influencer, right? He was writing these papers and they were going out and, and it shows how important, even back then, media was to, I mean, media has always been connected with politics and the use of media and specifically newspapers have been with political agendas really from the beginning. So even though we're seeing that so much now, we talk about fake news, it's really not something very new. It's kind of, the media companies have always been controlled by political agendas. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, but the way that he wrote and he talked to people and he put his words out there was really uh, a big impact. And and he died, he was shot by uh, Burr, which you'll see in the musical. And if you read his story and you just imagine, uh, he was so smart, just a brilliant person. Also, he was uh, an immigrant. And what, what might have happened if he had another 30 years? Who knows the uh, impact? I mean, it could have been bad though. It could have been good, we don't know. Um, but yeah, hopefully he's not lost in history. I think it's really interesting. Uh, I keep watching this Hamilton musical and now my image of alexander hamilton and the other cast of these people are now burned in my brain as the image of these people and i think that is so unique because in the time that we're talking about um institutional racism and the impacts um that that's had kind of the last 400 years here in america and the musical talks about who tells your story, right? And the impact of after you die, you don't really have control of your narrative. And if you listen to my show last week, I was talking about doing the shows is so much about me uh, being able to have a voice to somewhat control my narrative in the future. 
uh, when I pass away or with my children, but same thing. And, and Lin-Manuel Miranda is actually rewriting the past and creating an image of all of these founding fathers and these people, whether good or bad. But now um, the image that we see aren't these like old white dudes uh, with wigs on. I see Lin-Manuel Miranda when I think of Alexander Hamilton. And I just think that's really, really freaking cool to like take over the image of these people and like kind of flip it. And and I, I guess some people could argue that that's a bad thing, but I think that's awesome that history is being rewritten and it almost and it feels like we have this like diversity that was actually there that totally wasn't there at the time and i just think that's cool that history is being rewritten at least in my mind to picture it with more people of color than it actually was and so um yeah i'm just absolutely obsessed with hamilton the musical if you're wanting to dive in more maybe you watch it once and you want to go, why is Connor so obsessed with it? I watched this YouTube video about why the 10 dual commandments is so important. Um, and it breaks down sonically the song 10 dual commandments and the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and how that is a theme throughout the entire story, right? And, and the countdown, the 10 dual commandments was actually something dueling was a part of normal history. And there were actually a commandments of how to duel. And they go through that all in the musical, but also just uh, within the music that that 10 count is within so many of the different songs and you see it connect in so many different places. And when his son dies, there's a point where he's counting up to 10 and he stops at seven. Um, and that's symbolic of him passing away and he doesn't finish the, the last couple steps. And just absolutely amazing. The way that he's connected all the stories and the way that he's written so many of these songs and they have so many little details as you read more about Alexander Hamilton and his life and some of these other characters, he just uh, put in so many little details. There's a song and they say, blow us all away. And there's a story about how uh, he blew everyone away in, in one of the wars. And I, I just, it, it's absolutely phenomenal. There's no doubt on why it has gotten all the success it has. It's so clever and so creative and so amazing. And I'm grateful to have that right now because I've watched it. It's provided me so much entertainment, but also inspired me so much to like dig into history and learn about these things. Um, and then when I watched Hidden Figures at the theater, it just like continually was like, whoa, look at these people in history who were just like transcending the time that they were in and they were making such a big impact. And at the time they were just doing their jobs, they were just living their lives. Uh, but here we are, you know, for Alexander Hamilton, hundreds of years later, and, and the women from Hidden Figures, um, Katherine Johnson specifically, and the impact that she made, and she was just out there crunching numbers and, and doing her thing and, and uh, accomplishing her dreams and her goals of working at NASA. Just absolutely amazing. I think it's so cool. I've been so obsessed with, with legacy and, and future and how we tell our stories and obviously telling stories here and trying to, you know, put my voice out there as something that, you know, will be here forever. I'm going to put this on the internet and it'll always be there. Uh, hopefully for at least me to go back to, I think that's so cool. So, uh, yeah, uh, I could talk about Hamilton for a whole podcast. There's so many things that I'm obsessed with. Um, but yeah, it was, it, it, it's been an interesting week. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of the show. I hope you guys like this week in news. I'm going to keep doing that. It keeps me accountable to know what's going on and uh, going to keep doing the show. Thank you so much for joining me here at the Find Me in Seattle podcast. Please like, subscribe, comment, hit uh, that review button. If you're so inclined, if you're sitting there on iTunes, it's very easy to review uh, the podcast with some five stars. I'd appreciate that a lot. And uh, yeah, have a wonderful day, a wonderful weekend. I appreciate you so much and we'll see you next Friday.